half. It's my partner, Amy. Uh, they're the next. They're going to speak next. Um, Carl, are you with us? So, um, uh, we're going to be running Refugees, which is basically an overview of our plan. We're going to be talking about um, the inherency, which is what's happening now, uh, harms, so basically what's going to happen if we do not do the affirmative, which is our case. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about solvency, which is uh, how we plan to solve uh, these harms that are happening. And then we're going to be talking about our first advantage, which is soft power, which I'll explain what, what it is, and then uh, solving the terrorism. So if everyone's ready, then I'll start. Jeff, so you're ready? Negative, negative team, are you ready? Yeah. Eden, are you ready? Okay, then we'll start. The current refugee crisis risks the lives of 65 million displaced people. This crisis not only results in human suffering and death, but is far-reaching economic, humanitarian, and diplomatic repercussions. With this in mind, we propose the following plan. The United States federal government should substantially reduce its restrictions on legal immigration to the U.S. by eliminating the cap on refugees admitted to the U.S. and disregarding nation of origin of refugees. We'll start off with a description of the status quo called inherency. inherency. The resettlement of refugees has ground to a halt in the U.S. Feel like 2018. Trump's presidency has been brutal for refugees. Resettlement numbers are down the lowest recorded in a nearly 40-year history. Trends by nationality raise disturbing questions in the light of the president's hateful and bigoted rhetoric. The U.S. has admitted only 10,548 refugees, a 74% drop compared to the, year, uh, the same period in 2017. At a time when Middle Eastern nations are struggling to maintain asylum, for 5.6 million Syrian refugees, and when more than 700,000 displaced Rohingya have poured from Burma, and when most of the world's 20 million refugees are stuck with little prospect of returning home, Trump has slowed down refugee admissions. Admissions from countries covered by the president's travel ban have virtually ceased. We're gonna go ahead and move on now to the harms what will happen if we do not do the, do the affirmative. A global crisis of displaced persons is risking the lives of 65 million people worldwide, and it's increasing rapidly. Vergek 17. The most pressing human rights crisis of our time is a massive increase in displaced persons. There are now more displaced people around the world than at any other time since the Second World War. There is now a monumental international crisis stemming from the more than 60 million people who are now displaced, and there is nothing approaching a solution to the problem. The refugee crisis has been significantly increased as a result of Trump's executive orders. The UHNCR notes that 65.3 million individuals were forcibly displaced worldwide. The rate of displacement has been growing rapidly. And wealthy countries have shown a complete absence of leadership and responsibility. The United States received the world's the second highest number of new asylum applications in 2015. The data illustrates a humanitarian crisis of almost incalculable magnitude. The crisis is getting worse and is not only reflected by the tens of millions of people who are displaced, but is exaggerated by the fact that the countries that are providing temporary accommodations for these, for these displaced people are overwhelmingly developing countries. Next. The refugee crisis means suffering and discrimination for over 65 million people worldwide. Helish, 2017. A record number of, number of people were forcibly displaced worldwide. 65.3 million, according to the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner for Refugees. That is approximately equal to the populations of France or the United Kingdom. It is long past time to critically examine our country's role in forced migration. The U.S. has played a significant role in the displacement of people around the world and especially in the Middle Eastern and neighboring areas, where we've almost exclusively pursued a policy of war and militarism. For many, the alternative to displacement is death. 1.3 million have died in the course of the war on terror. Muslim refugees are portrayed in our media and our politicians as dangerous, and we're, and we're taught to fear refugees while simultaneously applauding ourselves as a country that is supposedly tolerant. I'm gonna go ahead and move on now to the U.S. has an ethical obligation to bolster the global refugee regime. And millions of lives are at stake and failure authorizes countless atrocities. Pulling back 16. An agent has a positive responsibility to help. Duty to take action over does not end at national borders. When nations become, or when people become aware of a crisis in a neighboring country, or even at a country in great distance, this puts them in moral proximity to those who are suffering. The duty to, sh to share the burden of assistance to displaced persons is proportional to the capability of doing so. These responsibilities may be carried out by granting refugee status to more than displaced. If, re if a government fails to protect its own people, either because it's unable or unwilling to do so, the duty to assist those who are threatened by this failure can pass on to other nations. The duty to protect the Syrian people does not only call for continuous political and diplomatic initiatives to find a, uh, to find a path towards their protection, but at a minimum, we need to live up to the 1951 Refugee Convention, calling for refugees fleeing persecution to be granted protection. The rich nations of the North have, have the cap capability and therefore the cap the responsibility to admit a larger number of refugees and asylum seekers and assist the poorer countries already hosting much of the world's refugees. Taking positive action 
However, oh sorry, taking positive steps to come to the aid of those who, are, who have been driven from their home will be essential to a more effective refugee regime. The duty to provide such assistance to those to those already displaced falls on the global community as a whole. Many millions of lives are at stake. I'm going to go ahead and move on now to solvency, which is how we plan to solve this, to solve these harms and the problem at hand. Substantially lifting the cap and disregarding nation of origin is key to obtaining global buy-in for greater resettlement. Baragak 17. The United States should in fact significantly increase the number of refugees it admits rather than suspending refugee arrivals. The United States still lags behind other developing countries, and the collective sympathy demonstrated by the United States by admitting refugees is significantly dwarfed by the empathy expressed by other developing countries. Recent developments indicate an overall hardening in many countries and their willingness to accept more displaced people. The United States proactively set on more displaced people than there are currently located in refugee camps around the world, and it should lift its quota. This will set up a desirable example for first world countries, therefore, therefore uh, significantly increasing the, the um, Sorry, the increasing the, the help that these people would be getting. And only the U.S. can solve. We have the space and economic flexibility. Worse than Conley 12. The United States is today one of the few global powers capable and willing to act in common interest. In absolute terms, the United States has never been more influential. The United States still remains the world's don, dominant economy, too, with the world's largest gross domestic product of $14 trillion. I'm going to go ahead and move on now to the first advantage of our plan, which is soft power. The planners source soft power to rebuilding relationships with all countries, and the plan would benefit Scuba 2017. The Trump administration announced, announced a maximum of 45,000 refugees to be admitted to resettlement in the U.S. This policy further endangers America, allowing an abnormally low number of refugees to enter the U.S. hurts far more than it helps. The fight against terrorism begins will diminish America's soft power. Hard power is the kind of power it used to force others, thus of violence, economic sanctions, and so on. To effectively fight violent extrem extremism, we need soft power. Soft power helps us recruit allies to sign onto our international agenda. They want the counter world we want. When we slam the door on refugees, we legitimize fear of Muslims in America, in America and abroad, and we feed the motivation of would-be terrorists. In the early 1990s, the United States again increased its refugee ceiling to accommodate those fleeing the explosion of civil, world, civil wars worldwide. Each time we made friends and influenced people. By disdaining refugees in the name of national security and economics, America becomes corrupt across this, sorry, far less of a global leader. And the decline of U.S. soft power guarantees instability in major power conflicts. Mars S-17. The emergence of a guiding coalition and its organizing structure, the post-war order, have created a world far less threatening to the United States. A reversal of that trend would threaten U.S. interests in dramatic ways. The international economy would sustain grievous blows, and the stage would be set to return to a major power conflict. I'm going to cut the card there and move on to our second advantage, which is the plan to stop terrorism. Preventing refugees from entering the U.S. and ruins our counterterrorism efforts by, by giving terrorist groups more motivation. Randolph 17. Only 20 out of 3.25 million refugees were convicted of attempting to engage in terrorist activities in the U.S. Only three U.S. citizens have been killed in terrorist attacks committed by refugees, ironically by Cuban refugees. There have been zero terrorist attacks or deaths committed by Syrian refugees in the United States. I'm going to cut the card there and move on to our next card, which says, Terrorism could easily cause a nuclear conflict and military lashout. Bun and Roth 17. The escalating threats make it easy to forget the nuclear nightmare that could result from a use of a single terrorist nuclear bomb. Vast areas would have to be evacuated and might be uninhabitable for years. Economic, political, and social aftershocks would ripple throughout the world. A single terrorist nuclear bomb would change history. The idea of terrorists accomplishing this is not out of the question. It is far easier to make a crude, unsafe, unreliable nuclear explosion. Studies have concluded that it is plausible that a terrorist group could make a crude bomb if they got the new, need, needed nuclear materials. With that being said, I am now open for cross-examination. I'm ready whenever you are. Yeah, go ahead. All right, how can we ensure that your plan uh, overcomes the backlog that we have of the people, of the, of the refugees already trying to get into America? Well, we're not going to be taking in all these refugees. We're not, like we said in our solvency argument, we're not going to be taking in all these mass amounts of people who are displaced and refugees. Other countries will not only help the backlog that we have right now, but will help the backlog that might ensue if we let in these refugees. But other countries giving us their support and letting in refugees, as well as the refugees that we're going to be letting in, will so not. So if we can't let in all these refugees, how do we claim that we get more soft power? Well, even with a small increase of people they'd be accepting, we would still be letting in a significant amount of people, and our soft power would increase because even with a small amount, if we showcase to the world that we are not going to be denying all these refugees and that we're not going to be racist and bigotry and towards them and declining them just because of where they come from, 
we will be increasing our soft power by showing that we are not a nation that would do that. I, I'm going along with that. How, we, how do we ensure that this plan gives us back the soft power we have as a, and overcoming other things such as the Trump administration and all the other administrations that's making America look bad right now in the eyes of the other countries? Well, even a small increase of soft power would help us globally. And right now, we, we might be losing a little bit of soft power, but the soft power gained by our plan would outweigh that heavily. All right, why do we want American soft power in the first place? Well, soft power helps us recruit allies who would sign our international agenda, as we said in our solvency argument. Basically, what soft power is doing is that it increases the likelihood of people joining on and helping us in our plan, and also would increase our alliances with other countries and their likelihood to help us prevent genocide and things like that. All right, uh, why is America unique to letting in all these refugees? For example, why does America solve as opposed to other countries? Well, we have the world's largest economy with more than 14 trillion, three times that of China. We have this, we, like we said in our um, solvency argument, we have the space and therefore the, the responsibility to admit these refugees. How does having a big economy translate to us being the best place for these refugees to come in? Well, it's economic flexibility. Uh, okay, going in with that, uh, in your Holmes evidence, the third card you read, the Hodge 17 evidence, yes. uh, you talked about how America is currently scared of Muslim uh, people. H how will we show it that if these people come in, that America is still not going to be scared of these people and thus create discrimination against well, these like people? We, well, like we said in our card, we're taught, to f we were taught that because of how we were stopping them at the borders and not letting them in. If we were to let them in, America would not would see that we're not threatened by them and that it would stop any racism or bigotry from ensuing us. But how is passing the plan going to take away all the stigmatisms that people have against these people? Well, they have that because we're stopping them at the border, like we said in our, like we said in the evidence. We're taught to fear that because of us stopping at the border. Doing that shows the American populace that we do not trust and we fear these people. So by stopping that and showing them that we can trust them, it conveys to the American people that we do not, that these people should not be feared nor hated on. Uh, uh, and lastly, uh, why, uh, why is, um, how does your plan solve for terrorism? Uh, yeah, how does your plan solve for terrorism? Yeah, but, yes. um, so basically, by we're giving these refugee, or we're giving these terrorist groups more motivation by denying these refugees because they grow a, they grow hateful to the United States and they're more likely to go and join terrorist groups in their nations. And by stopping that and letting them in, we not only give terrorist groups less motivation to attack us, but we sever their manpower, their manpower, and we basically give them less motivation to attack us in the first place.